I'm Todd McKay. And I'm Chris Sims. And this is the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. We're dedicated to lower taxes, less waste, and more accountable government. In this episode, we're going to take a deep dive to look at where each province stands when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic response, what's opening up, what's staying closed, and what kind of moves the governments are making to move on. And we've also got a Waste Watch story about government officials who blew taxpayers' money flying chefs around the world. But first, Todd, do you listen to Nickelback? I've been known to crank the uh, the Nickelback up in the truck on the back roads before, yep. And what about Avril Lavigne? Uh, not so much, but I know who you're talking about. I think she married one of those uh, Nickelback fellas. But why are we talking about rock stars? I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but when Nickelback singer, you're right, Chad Kroger and Avril Lavigne were married, they bought a big schmancy mansion in Los Angeles back in 2015. It was gorgeous. It had six bedrooms, seven and a half bathrooms, a gym, basketball court, gourmet kitchen, three dishwashers, you name it. Three dishwashers are, sort of sounds like a lot. But Chris, <laughs> this is a taxpayer podcast. This is an entertainment tonight. What are we talking about uh, rock stars for? Because they actually spent less money buying their mansion, the whole mansion in Los Angeles, than the National Capital Commission is spending on the Prime Minister's cottage reno at Harrington Lake. Chad and Avril reportedly paid about $5.4 million for their entire rock star house, while the NCC is spending $8.6 million in taxpayers' dollars for a cottage reno. Oh my goodness. Clearly the government has made this way too complicated. It's certainly getting taxpayers frustrated. Unfortunately, there's more to it too. Uh, if you take a look at NHL star, for example, Corey Perry, he bought his entire fancy house in London, Ontario for $7.2 million last year. And many folks in the area actually thought he was being super generous with that amount. So again, an entire fancy house was bought for less than this cottage reno at Harrington Lake. But if we want to compare apples to apples, cottages to cottages, Harrington Lake supposed to be a nice summer retreat. Well, actress Halle Berry, she bought a summer retreat, very fancy cottage in the Laurentians for $1.6 million. Okay, so that's Halle Berry, the one who won an Oscar for Monsters Ball. She's one of the X-Men. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, let's take a step back here. We've got a Canadian rock star couple, mm -hmm. an Academy Award winning actress, and a Stanley Cup champion hockey player, and they're all able to buy homes and cottages for less money than it takes the National Capital Commission just to reno the Harrington Lake Cottage for the Prime Minister? Yeah, it's brutal. Uh, and that's just one reno of one of those buildings on that land. There are several more buildings on that land. If we compare the sale prices of these mansion cottages to mansion cottages, Canadian taxpayers are still getting ripped off here. So if you take a look at the cottages in that super posh Muskoka region in Ontario, same neighborhood as Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn, another superstar couple. That recently sold for $3.8 million in that neighborhood. These cottages are mansions, keep in mind. The boathouses on these properties are way fancier than most people's homes. Okay, so again, let's take a step back. The prime minister could just walk away from the Harrington Lake property throw the keys over his shoulders, never look back, and buy a cottage, you know, down the road from Kevin O'Leary, and he'd still save money? Yes. In fact, you could buy all kinds of these places and still have some dough left over. We need to remember the National Capital Commission actually wants to blow $17 million on all the renovations at Harrington Lake and Gatineau Park. And for that amount of money, you tally it up, you could buy Chad and Avril's house in Los Angeles, $5.4 million. Corey Perry's house, NHL superstar in London, $7.2 million. Halle Berry's Laurentian Cottage for $1.6 million. And you could buy a Muskoka Mansion Cottage for $2.5 million. If you did all that, you'd still have about $300,000 left over. That'd be enough to buy a Lamborghini to drive to the cottage and park in your huge heated garage. What is going on? That's crazy. Based mm -hmm. on the price of this reno, the National Capital Commission must be the worst contractor in Canada. So folks, stay tuned on this. This isn't going to be the last story you hear about this. We are turning the heat way up on the National Capital Commission. They're going to be hearing from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation on a pretty regular basis, and it's going to get pretty toasty. 
The Canadian Taxpayers Federation's Ontario Director Jasmine Pickle is up next to tell us plans to reopen the economy across Canada and around the world. It's time for our deep dive, and this is a part of the show when we get deeper into important issues that matter to taxpayers. Jasmine, what do you have to talk to us about today? Todd, like everyone in Canada, I'm wondering when the economy is going to reopen. Now, as a disclosure, I have a vested interest in this issue because I've been trying to plan a wedding for June 20th. So I've been watching the news super closely to try to figure out when is Ontario's economy going to reopen? When are the other provinces opening up? And what's been going on internationally? Yeah, well, congratulations on uh, on the wedding. Uh, good luck actually getting it off the ground. That's going to be a bit of a tricky situation this year. But of course, you certainly aren't the only one wondering what's uh, what's going on. Before we get too much further on this, though, I feel like we've got to give a little bit of a disclaimer. We are not medical professionals, so please listen to the smart people when you're making decisions about how to move forward on things. Make sure you stay safe. <laughs> yeah, certainly no medical advice from me on the show today, but I should mention that we're recording this episode a couple days before it will be going live, so there could be some changes that have been announced in that time. Yeah, and actually that leads to one more disclaimer. This whole situation is so crazy that the only certainty I feel is that every prediction I make is probably going to be wrong to some degree. But here at the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we're really committed to government accountability. And one of the best ways we can do that is to tell people what different governments are doing so that you can uh, uh, look around, compare different decisions they're making, and hold your government accountable uh, based on what's happening everywhere. So going from that point of view, Jasmine, where do you want to start? Here's a clip from the first province to start rolling out their reopening plan. By any objective measure, what we are doing in Saskatchewan, it is working. What you are doing is working. As of today, Saskatchewan has 326 cases of COVID-19. Four people have unfortunately passed, and we mourn with their families and with their friends. But 261 people have now recovered from the virus, and today there are only 61 active cases and just five people in hospital. So to put those numbers in context, on a per capita basis, the number of COVID-19 cases in Saskatchewan is about 70% below the Canadian average. And the number of serious outcomes, hospitalizations and deaths, is more than 90% below the national average. And at the same time, the COVID-19 testing rate in Saskatchewan is more than 40% higher than the national average. We are doing so well here. So we can continue to reduce the spread and to keep those case numbers low, while at the same time, can we gradually allow more businesses to reopen and more Saskatchewan people to return to work? Well, I believe we can, but only if we proceed with caution, great caution. That, Todd, was Premier Scott Moe announcing his province's five-step plan for reopening that will begin on May 4th. So in Saskatchewan right now, different types of businesses will gradually reopen over the course of the month, starting with medical clinics, low-risk outdoor activities like fishing, um, but at least in the first phase, there still won't be any school. The next phase of Saskatchewan's reopening plan will start on May 19th, and from there we'll see different phases rolled out based on monitoring their doing of the virus. So I live in Moose Jaw, and it's good to hear that uh, things are opening up, but I can tell you for sure, school is definitely not in session. You can probably hear my kids in the background from time to time here. Uh, why was Saskatchewan uh, at the front of the list uh, in terms of reopening? Saskatchewan and New Brunswick actually were the first two provinces to unroll their reopening plans and that's probably because they had some of the lowest number of cases across the country. So if you look at Saskatchewan, they had at the time of recording around 366 total cases. Uh, New Brunswick had 118, which combined is less than 1% of 
total cases in Canada. You also see PEI, which had a super low number, and they're launching their reopening plan on May 1st, although their state of emergency will last until at least the end of May, meaning that they're going to screen people at entry points into the province and also require anyone coming in to self-isolate for 14 days. It's kind of nice to be an island in this kind of a situation, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, PEI, they've started reopening. Who's next up? So Manitoba's Premier, Brian Pallister, just announced that they'll be opening back up with a multi-phased plan starting on May 4th. So that will look like re some retail stores, restaurant patios, hair salons, but non-essential businesses will still have some limitations placed on them. Uh, so according to the, their plan, it will be they have to limit capacity to 50% of the store or to have one person per 10 square meters. They're still limiting gatherings to 10 people or less, and that won't ease up until June 1st at the very soonest. Um, but again, Manitoba still has, you know, less than 300 cases, which is less than a percent of Canada's total. Okay, so if you add it all up for Manitoba, Saskatchewan, PEI, and New Brunswick, uh, it's less than 2% of the total COVID cases in all of Canada, and those provinces are starting to uh, reopen slowly in May. So what's going on with the big provinces in Canada? Over 80% of COVID cases in Canada are from Ontario and Quebec, but the provinces are really differing in their reopening plans. But last week, Premier Ford delivered his government's plan to reopen the Ontario economy, which basically was a big nothing burger. The framework is about how we're reopening, not when we're reopening. And let me be crystal clear. As long as this virus remains a threat to Ontario, we will continue to take every precaution necessary. We will continue to act based on the best advice available to us. No one wants the economy to open up more than I do, but we can't take anything for granted. Actually, Premier Ford, as a bride who said to reschedule her wedding, I'm pretty sure I want the economy to reopen more. But, I mean, I wasn't the only one disappointed by the lack of detail in the Premier's announcement. Listen to what Randall Denley wrote in the National Post, and I quote, In Ontario, all we know is that things will eventually reopen according to a timetable established by public health officials who are apparently in complete control of the provincial government. Instead of getting down to work and producing a result, as Saskatchewan has done, Ontario cabinet ministers will be consulting everyone under the sun in the famous coming days. Pressed for specifics at a press conference Monday, Ford offered a variety of non-answers. It was a disappointing variance from the frankness he's exhibited throughout the pandemic crisis. So basically, Todd, no one in Ontario, Premier included, knows what's happening. Yeah, and that is frustrating because a lot of people need to make decisions. And even if you have a plan that needs to change, it's still nice to have some kind of a plan. How does that compare to what they're doing over in Quebec? So even though Ontario is the most populous province in Canada, they actually don't have the highest number of cases. Quebec does. So if you compare, Ontario has about 15 million people, just, just under. They have 15,000 cases or so. Quebec has a population of 8.5 million, but they've got over 26,000 cases. So if you think about it this way, Quebec is only 23% of Canada's population, but it has 50% of Canada's COVID-19 cases and close to 60% of Canada's COVID-19 deaths. Wow. So what's going on over there? I came across a few different explanations, but one example would be uh, in Quebec, they have their students spring break earlier, and in some cases, two weeks earlier than the rest of the country. So those students and their families had traveled abroad, either to Europe or the USA, uh, before the travel restrictions were really put in place. So they could have brought a lot more cases back to the province. But Despite this, even though Quebec has the highest rates of COVID-19 in the country, they're still opening up their elementary schools on May 11th. So uh, the rest of the businesses also will follow suit. So the province with the highest number of cases is reopening faster than other provinces with fewer cases. Do I have that right? Exactly. So Ontario, with roughly half the number of cases per capita compared to Quebec, uh, has already announced that it won't be opening up its elementary schools before May 31st. But, I mean, Quebec's plan outside of Montreal is to open them on May 11th. 
Well, clearly those are two very different approaches. Uh, what provinces do we have left? So at the time of recording this podcast, we have four provinces that haven't announced the reopening plans yet, which include Nova Scotia. They have around 1,000 cases. Newfoundland at 250. British Columbia with 2,000 cases. And Alberta at around 4,700. But I should say it's possible Kenny might release his reopening plan before the podcast airs. But Todd, I just want to take one minute to talk about BC and Ontario because something interesting happened. They both had the same first case about a day apart, so around the same time, but BC's cases per capita are roughly one third of where Ontario sits. Hmm, That is interesting. What happened so differently in BC? So BC's chief medical health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, has said it's both a mix of preparation and luck. Luck because, like I said, they're student spring break is about two weeks after Quebec, so they could put travel restrictions in place, but also they were better prepared. So one example of how they prepared better would be they stopped long-term care workers from working at multiple sites really early on, and that seems to have worked. So if BC is more successful at flattening the curve than Ontario and Quebec, does that mean it's opening up its economy quicker? Unfortunately not. So BC Premier John Horgan has said he'll announce their economic reopening plan by mid-May. Okay, so that's a pretty good picture of what's happening in Canada. When we get outside of uh, our borders, what's happening in the rest of the world? Well, when we look to our southern neighbors in the U.S., they're taking the same sort of federalist approach as Canada, where they're allowing, you know, a decentralized approach where states can determine their own reopening plans. Although the president has unveiled, uh, you know, guidelines from the White House for, quote, opening up America again, which will also be a three-phased approach that can be implemented at the state level. I should note, though, that there's a great degree of geographic variance when it comes to this virus. So if you look at New York, for example, it's really the epicenter of the virus in the United States, whereas Georgia was reopening in late April. So they opened hair salons and even bowling alleys. Um, But I should mention that Canada in general has slowed the virus much more effectively than the U.S. Okay, so that gives us a view of uh, what's happening in the States. Let's let's go uh, uh, out further. What's happening in the rest of the world? So Todd, I'm sure that our listeners have all heard the Swedish model mentioned. So what's going on in Sweden is that they really didn't have the same sort of strict Uh, economic shutdown that we've seen in many different states across the world. So in Sweden, they left their elementary schools open, uh, restaurants remained open, they allowed gatherings of up to 50 people. Uh, You know, here in Ontario, it was banned, I think, to five. Um, So it's, as you can see, very different. They just encouraged people who were 70 or older to stay home. So in Sweden, they really delegated the responsibility to individuals, you know, and really, I think we saw a lot of them take that quite seriously. So even though they hadn't mandated businesses to close, um, some did voluntarily, some ski resorts uh, said, you know, this, we don't think this is safe. So we'll shut down, we'll assess our own risk. So a lot of people are questioning, you know, if they were able to avoid shutting down their economy to the same extent, what are the health repercussions? So, so far, Sweden has had more deaths per million than the U.S. or Canada, but it's, I think, noteworthy that they've actually had less than the U.K., Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, so it's not like they're at the top of the spectrum. Um, On an economic level, people are then saying, okay, well, were they able to salvage their economy. So the jury's still out on that one. It's really difficult, I think, with globalism to parse apart how their economy has performed when, you know, they're a heavily exporting uh, country that relies heavily on exports and, you know, all the countries that they trade with are, are impacted as well. But if you look at their rates of unemployment and compare that to Norway, for example, a country that clamped down more strictly, Sweden actually has a lower unemployment rate than Norway. So although it's really hard to tell at this point, um, you know, it does look like it, it's, it's slightly better. Although really the big question here will be, we'll have to wait to see if their healthcare system gets overwhelmed, but so far it hasn't. 
hopefully it works out uh, well in Sweden. They're taking a very different approach. But in reality, it's going to be months or even years before we know who made the right decisions at the right point. In the meantime, here is one point of certainty. Governments owe us as much information as possible. We're all trying to make decisions in our own lives. Uh, we need information, even if it's changing. So governments need to tell us what's going on. Oh, 100%. Transparency is super important right now. And it's even more important, you know, when we have to make these decisions about our health and our jobs. So that's why it's really been good to see our leaders rolling out their plans. So we can all try to make plans of our own. Well, you know what? Thank you, Jasmine, for diving into this issue for us. And good luck with the wedding planning. Uh, for those of you out there, if you want to know more about what the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is recommending to get the economy back on track as soon as it reopens, head on over to taxpayer.com. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, president of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Sorry for interrupting the podcast, but I wanted to take a few seconds of your time to tell you more about the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. We are 235,000 Canadians from coast to coast that are fed up. We are fed up with politicians taking too much out of our paychecks, often to waste it on a bunch of pet projects, corporate welfare, and pork barreling to buy votes. We organize campaigns to push back on these politicians. These campaigns often include petition drives, billboards, media stunts, and more. But most importantly, they ask our supporters to pitch in and take action. Alone, we're a voice in the wilderness. Together, we're an army to be reckoned with. You can join the fight and sign up at no cost at taxpayer.com. That website again is taxpayer.com. Okay, now back to the podcast. It's time for Waste Watch. This is when we get to expose the dumb things that governments are wasting your money on. Todd, what do you have for us today? So listen, Chris. Imagine you're a diplomat, a Canadian diplomat, you're working in some far-flung place, and uh, you're a little bit hungry, you got some people coming over, what are you going to do? I don't know, uh, check out my fancy fridge, see what's there, order in? No, 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 you're way off. What you do is you phone back to Ottawa, you tell them to find some fancy pants chefs, put them on a plane, fly them out to you to cook dinner. That's what you what? do. What? That sounds crazy expensive. It is crazy expensive. Remember when Prime Minister Justin Trudeau went to India, he brought his tickle trunk full of costumes and he did all his dance moves and all that kind of stuff. He also spent $17,000 to take a Canadian chef to India to cook Indian food. Remember that? I do remember that, actually. We gave the Prime Minister a Teddy Waste Award for that India trip. And that was a well-deserved award. But it got us wondering... Is this a one-off thing or might there be more to it? So we filed a ton of access to information requests. Turns out there's a whole program for this kind of nonsense. And there was all kinds of trips like this. Uh, one chef flew down to Miami for $4,500. Another chef went to the Dominican Republic for $15,000. Oh my goodness. What's the budget for this? So over the past few years, Global Affairs Canada has budgeted four and a half million dollars for its Mission Cultural Fund. Ottawa spent more than four million dollars on this? No, no. It budgeted four and a half million. Oh. It actually spent 11 million dollars. Whoa, that is more than double the budget. That's exactly right. And that's why we gave Global Affairs Canada this year's federal Teddy Waste Award. So every year, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we give out awards for the dumbest, most infuriating, most funny examples of government waste. And flying chefs all over the world, even if they'd stayed on budget, we probably would have given them the Teddy Award for this. That's how dumb this is. But global affairs went well over double the budget, blew the budget all over the place. So it was an absolute runaway winner for the Teddy Waste Award. You know, we make fun of stuff like this because it's really dumb to spend 17 grand to fly a chef to India to cook Indian food, but there really is a serious side to all this. Well, that's right. And I mean, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that government money is actually our money. So let's provide just a little bit of context. According to Statistics Canada, the average Canadian household spends just about six grand a year on groceries. That means the government's 
could have bought groceries for 1,800 families for a year with the money it blew on this fly a chef program all over the place. That would have done a lot more good for a lot more families than uh, producing fancy meals in far flung places. Oh, no kidding. And you know, this is why we make fun of politicians for doing dumb things like this. It drives them crazy when we do it. And it also makes them think twice about wasting your money. So if we make fun of them now, next time down the road, they might have that little voice in their head going, ah, 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 you might wind up with a golden pig statue with your name on it. Don't do this dumb thing. And if you want to find out more about this story specifically, go to our show notes or go to our website, taxpayer.com. Thanks for listening to the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. Well, and thanks to James Wood. He's the guy who edits all of this, edits out the dumb things we say, tries to leave at least a few smart things. (laughs) Uh, Man, thank goodness for that guy. Also, check out our show notes for more information about all of uh, this episode's stories. And please, subscribe, like, share, review our show. It really helps us get the word out to more people. And uh, thanks again for listening. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, President of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. If you've got another minute, I'd like to ask you to think about the one person you know that would really enjoy listening to this podcast. Do us a favor and do them a favor and send them a quick note to let them know about it. At the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we believe there is power in numbers. That's why we've worked so hard to build an army of taxpayers who are ready to push back. And we did it because people like you shared our work with that one person that they knew would really appreciate taking part. Thanks for listening, and thanks for doing your part to make Canada a better place.